Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Kupfer. I'm the president of Conserve America. We are delighted today to be joined by Senator Kevin Kramer from North Dakota. Uh, Senator Kramer has had a relationship with Conserve America uh, since he joined the Senate. Uh, he's a member of the Roosevelt Conservation Caucus, which is a group of members in both the House and the Senate who seriously take the challenges of uh, energy, environment, conservation, and help to work on durable market-based uh, solutions to those challenges. Uh, the senator uh, has a long history of involvement in the energy environmental space. He served on the North Dakota Public Service Commission for almost a decade, uh, served three terms in the House, uh, and in 2018 was elected to the Senate where he serves on a number of committees and for our purposes, uh, the most important one being the Environment and Public Works uh, Committee. So we're, we're thrilled to have him uh, join us for one of our conversations with significant uh, and influential members of Congress. So Senator, uh, thanks, for, thanks for being with us. Oh, it's my pleasure, Jeff. Thanks for, uh, thanks for lining this up. As you can tell, I have a little scratchy voice, but I'm fine. Um, and I love the, I love the, uh, the Roosevelt Conservation Caucus, because of course, North Dakota is the land of Roosevelt. This is where he came and ranched and had two ranches in North Dakota. Um, and of course, Theodore Roosevelt National Park is dedicated to him in Western North Dakota and his incredible conservation history. And um, of course, now they're, they're actually in construction out by Medora uh, of the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library, which I believe will be a, a, a tremendous asset to the really to the conservative conservation um, discussion, debate, and, uh, and academic and, and research, uh, just and just a great place to get together to talk about uh, conservation in in, uh, in this century and, and beyond. Yeah, what, what word about that uh, about the construction? I think it's starting to get out a little bit more than it has been in the past, and I know uh, a number of us are all looking forward to when it actually. Uh, uh, gets done and people are able to visit it. So. Might have to have a Conserve America studio built in there. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be great. We can certainly use it as the backdrop <laughs> instead of what I have now. Um, uh, you, uh, you, you've been involved in a number of significant pieces of, uh, of, of, of legislation, and uh, you introduced uh, a bill earlier this Congress, which uh, passed out of uh, EPW committee uh, earlier this year called the Prove It Act. And I'd like you to take a minute to describe uh, what it's all about and why you think it's important. Sure. Well, my good friend, um, Chris Coons, and I introduced Prove It Act as uh, sort of the, the, the baby step, if you will, in, in identifying with clear data just how, how well the United States manufacturing sector does manufacturing. And, you know, we've spent so much time, so many decades really beating ourselves up for how productive the United States is. What we haven't done is demonstrated how much better we do it than everybody else. And when I say better, Jeff, I mean cleaner, um, you know, higher standards, environmental standards, as well as workplace standards. And so what Prove It does is it, it gives the authority um, to the Department of Energy to work with the other relevant agencies to collect and accumulate the data that would demonstrate the carbon intensity of the top couple of dozen uh, products that we manufacture in the United States, do the same for other countries uh, who, in, in various categories, countries that we have trade agreements with, countries that we align with, you know, that are allies, uh, countries that are adversaries, countries that don't do it as well as us, and just sort of create this database that proves what, that what we say, what we believe about our exceptionalism is in fact the truth. And more importantly, that that data is, is solid enough that we can use it to demonstrate that in the global marketplace. As we look at uh, some of our friends, um, looking at things like carbon border adjustment mechanisms and, and, and uh, you know, carbon prices uh, domestically, as well as in, in trade policy, so that we can defend ourselves against people, against countries that may try to impose a tax on our production based on carbon intensity. And then ultimately it becomes you know, a, a valuable database for, for lots of other things, because you also have in our own country, right here in the United States, well-intentioned people who, who have plans to 
say, put a carbon tax, a domestic carbon tax on, or even eventually a carbon border adjustment mechanism. And I'd love to get into that discussion a little bit. But what I don't want to see is, um, I don't want to see people picking arbitrary, you know, solutions, arbitrary numbers, if you will, to apply to a tax or a price on carbon in a country that already does this so well that we need we need to recognize that there's already a price on the on domestic carbon by virtue of our compliance with our very high uh, very high standards. So if there's going to be a carbon tax, if there's going to be a carbon border adjustment mechanism, let's base it on real data rather than base it on emotion or just you know taking a wild guess. So anyway, back to the origins. Of it. It's a first step in identifying. With existing data, by the way, Jeff, I think it's really important to people understand with, uh, there's a lot of existing data. It's just not been compiled and compared and, and put in a, in a manner that's, that can prove it, if you will. There could be evidence in a, uh, in a trade dispute or some sort of a negotiation. Well, w w one would think that, that collecting data and having re re reliable data is something that most people would, would coalesce around and say, okay, that makes sense. But but you, you, you've gotten a decent amount of blowback, uh, especially on, on the right for, right for beginning to to for introducing this and for talking about it. So um, you explain wh sure. where, where you think that's coming from and how you would address that. No, it's a great point. And you're right. I have. But I'll be to be honest with you, the more I talk about it, the, the, the more the blowback sort of. I don't want to say it's resisted, but the more it sort of settles a little bit. So the blowback comes from people who see the word carbon and they see and they apply it to things like a, a domestic tax or a, a, a tariff of some sort, and they immediately see us punishing ourselves. But once I explain, it's actually the opposite. Not only are we not punishing our, our industries, we're actually giving them the the really the tools they need to demonstrate to trading partners, to trading competitors, hey, we're already paying a carbon tax in the United States because we're complying with the highest standards in the world. We're telling our, our trade partners, uh, take the United Kingdom or, or the European Union, for example, who is now preparing, they, they've already passed a, a C, CBAM, they're preparing to, to execute that shortly. Um, and if they come at us with and, and put a tax on our products going into their countries, when we when we know that we are at least comparable, if not superior, and if we're superior, it's by a little bit. Um, I, I, if we can demonstrate that, it certainly makes it more difficult for them to tax our products. But even better than that, Jeff, what I would say is, it is time for like-minded countries to band together, not 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 by getting rid of our own sovereignty, but rather by identifying our commonality and becoming a, a, a trading block. And uh, because the real the real adversary here are not other countries that that in, in, you know implement the same standards we have. It's the countries like China and Russia, maybe some you know Venezuela, countries who don't have our standards, who lowball the price of everything they manufacture. And um, and that's part of the, the other part of the pushback comes from people who rather like getting cheap stuff from other countries, while the, we look the other way at their abuses of of the, the conditions, the human conditions, um, you know, and and certainly the environmental conditions with which they they do this. So the way they with which they they manufacture and produce products. So and then in the energy sector, when you look at what's going on in Europe, when you see what's happening in the the war, um, Putin's war on Ukraine, you've seen energy become a weapon. And I'm not against energy being a weapon as long as it's our weapon. And, and I prefer to call it the peaceful tools of energy production rather than the weapons of war. And uh, when we have a, a world out there that's hungry for, um, for energy, we have a growing, growing populations uh, in the places where the populations are growing the fastest are the developing nations, particularly the nations in Africa, that um, could sure use a lot of the clean energy produced in the United States and other places um, rather than, you know, energy produced by slave labor uh, in the very filthy conditions in their own countries. So uh, I just think there's a lot of opportunity, but the whole story has to be told. I appreciate you helping me tell it. I will say this, though, with regard to prove it and the passage of it out of the committee, four Republicans did vote for it. And uh, I think there are at least four more that could. 
if we um, continue to tell the story, if they hear from stakeholders, uh, but even some of the stakeholders, Jeff, they just, they see carbon, they see, you know, data and they think slippery slope. I understand that some people abuse data, but right now I think the people are abusing the lack of data and uh, I'd prefer to have the evidence in our toolkit. And and so as you, and when, when you mentioned CBAM before, that's car, uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism, which would look at the, at the, at the, the carbon intensity of, of various products. So when when you think about the next steps, if prove it actually passes, do you have a, a a pathway by which you would like to see it be used in as you look into the future, or, you, or do you look at it one step at a time? Well, it's a great question. I mean, I, I think you have to cast a bit of a vision. I mean, we we are talking about an issue that globally uh, is a very big issue, and when I say an issue, I'm talking about about climate change itself. And a lot of people, and this is what frustrates some people, they push back because they don't believe climate change is real, or they don't believe that humans are the cause of it, or they don't believe that we're as bad as the others, all of which may be true. And the thing I know about carbon, uh, you know, about the carbon debate is that the vast majority of people in the world believe that the climate is changing. They believe that CO2 emissions are part of the problem. But almost no two people agree exactly on, on, you know, how bad it is, whose fault it is, you know, is it, you know, is it worth sounding the alarm or is it a long term thing? I think the, I think you have to cast a that longer vision, Jeff. That said, um, our politics in the United States sort of requires a one step at a time method, and and that's fine by me. I. I I happen to think that it's not as, you know, the problem isn't as imminent as some people say. I also happen to believe that we're not going to solve it overnight. So let's take it one step at a time. With regard to what I could see, you know, the, the data being used for, besides defending ourselves in a trade dispute or a trade negotiation of some sort with both allies and adversaries, I also think I, I've made I've made no secret that I ha do have some interest in putting tariffs on polluting countries, selling steep, cheap stuff into our country to the disadvantage of our workers, to the disadvantage of our manufacturers and producers, to the disadvantage of our farmers, quite honestly, and our own energy industry. So, um, you know, I'd much rather have a science-based, data-based carbon border adjustment mechanism than an arbitrary one um, or a punitive one, because my ultimate goal would be to change the behavior of polluting countries, not to just punish them. I think when you start looking at things like the tax code, you start looking at um, things like regulations. You know, the goal ought to be the goal ought to be a a cleaner, more efficient, um, you know, more productive sector. Whether it's manufacturing steel or cement or plastics or or natural gas or whatever the case might be, not for it to be a revenue stream, right? So, it's, any type of a tax or a tariff ought to be a temporary measure so that we can level the playing field so that we're not disadvantaged by our own excellence. Okay. So speaking of, uh, of, of the climate issue, um, as, 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 as you know, obviously, uh, in 2022, uh, the administration uh, jammed through the Inflation Reduction Act on party line vote. You didn't vote for it. No other Republicans voted for it. Uh, but here we are uh, mm -hmm. now in, in 2024. And there's discussion about what to do with the IRA if Republicans are in a position to uh, impact it going forward. So how do you look at uh, the provisions of the IRA in general? No, I appreciate that question because you're right. And I anticipate we very well might find ourselves in that situation where a, a slight majority in both the House and the Senate for Republicans, along with a, a President Trump, presents the opportunity to pass some significant tax revenue and um, spending policies. And the IRA, which is very unpopular among Republicans, is a key target for a lot of people to just want to repeal it. And while that may be okay, you know, like any large piece of legislation, there are some things in it that we rather like. And so I, what I would advise and have already begun to advise uh, President Trump and his people is let's take a scalpel, not a chainsaw, to the IRA, let's find those things that have been around for a very long time or some investments that make no sense at all, but let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Let's look for those nuggets 
Um, and, and a couple of them that come to mind for me, of course, would be the 45Q tax credit, something that I've supported, something that Senator Hovind has supported. In fact, I would go so far as to say we've championed the 45Q tax credit, which is that tax credit that, that um, rewards, incentivizes the, the capture of CO2 from power plants, ethanol plants, refineries, uh, wherever it can be captured, and then storing it um, in one instance or using it for enhanced oil recovery in other instances. Of course, in North Dakota, we have the opportunity to do both. And we produce electricity with coal. We, we produce a lot of ethanol uh, with corn. And we produce a lot of oil and natural gas. And so the opportunities to capture CO2 and then and then be incentivized to, you know, to capture it and, and, and store it or to use it for enhanced oil recovery becomes both... Um, it, it reduces, of course, the carbon into the atmosphere, which is goal number one. But it also uses that CO2 in the case of enhanced oil recovery, not as a pollutant, but rather as a commodity that has value in the marketplace. And CO2 has other value. We've been capturing CO2 in North Dakota, uh, based on electric has in its coal gasification facility for the last 30 years. We've used that CO2, we pipe it to Saskatchewan, and they use it for enhanced oil recovery in Canada. But other parts of it are captured and used for things like fertilizer. And so, again, we've already done this in North Dakota for many years, for decades, and know how to do it. So um, we'd like to hang on to that 45Q. It's, it's new. It's it's just getting started, and we're still seeing commercial applications um, being realized and invented. Uh, the other one, of course, is the nuclear production tax credit. I've been a strong supporter of nuclear. The one form of fuel that we don't uh, produce in, in North Dakota, although we do have some uranium, and depending on what happens, there could be opportunities. But... Um, you know, for anybody that really cares about emissions and cares about 24 hours, seven day a week uh, electricity, and I think we all ought to care about that, um, nuclear is really the perfect fuel. And I think we have acquiesced our excellence and our academic and intellectual understanding, uh, certainly the production and, and the advancement of uranium to not just to other countries, but to our fiercest enemies, places like Russia and, and China. And we should not have done that but we need to bring as much of that back as we can, because I do believe whether it's small, probably most likely small modular reactors, but also some of the larger facilities as, as the technology advances and confidence is gained. Um, so that's, that's another one of those credits that helps advance modern nuclear um, energy. And uh, I'd hate to see us lose those while throwing out, as I said, a lot of the bad things that are in the IRA. But, but 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 before we go, um, it, uh, just uh, wondering uh, if you could describe those conversations that you've had with with uh, with former President Trump and his team, and and what you think their reaction is to some of those arguments that you've been making. Sure. Well, you know, it depends on who who you're talking to. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is going to be, well, first of all, to to your point, remember that the, at the heart of the Trump doctrine is America first. I think everything you and I have been talking about is very much America first, bringing back more nuclear to the United States when we've acquiesced it to our enemies and made ourselves dependent on it. That's very America first. When you talk about you know capturing of carbon um, in in various streams, whether it's uh, you know electric generation or or gasification or manufacturing of some sort or, or refining fuels and and corn ethanol. Um, you know that that's a very much an America first solution, and so it, while it, while the idea of carbon isn't in you know isn't sort of the um, the first you know top of the mind or intuitive to folks in the Trump universe, it is when you start talking about it in the context of an America first strategy. Having said all of that, I, I also have to convince more of my own colleagues, and I I don't think that's as hard a challenge because um, we're going to have to have a budget reconciliation. Uh, if we're going to do all of this and then have a strategy where we spend more time with solutions and less time with our own internal politics, not a small matter uh, among, you know, 50 plus um, very strong willed, confident people who think they should be president, um, who have really good, strong ideas. <laughs> so uh, and, and independent minded, I might add. So uh, we have we have plenty of work to do, but I think the story almost tells itself. Um, and we just need to be articulating it on a regular basis.
Okay. Well, you, you've been super generous with your time. We, re we really appreciate lots more issues to cover. And so we hope to continue this dialogue with you uh, in the future and look forward to working with you and your staff as, as the rest of this Congress and, and into the next one as well. You're up for re-election this year and uh, we're hoping another six more years. Well, so far, low drama. I like it that way. I hope to be around six more years too. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. And I, I also look forward to the continuing the conversation, Jeff. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks, Senator. Take care. Bye-bye.